Thank you. One of the most memorable and beautiful experiences of my life was when I sat completely alone, free from any distractions, in the Salon de Compagnie of the Petit Trianon at Versailles. I sat there listening to the ticking of the 18th century clock, watching the light change from golden sunlight to warm candlelight as the decoration of the room harmoniously and magically came alive. It is at that idyllic moment when historic memories slowly manifest. As the clock chimed, one could smell the flowers or the freshly prepared coffee, hear the patter of conversation or the lilting of music, feel the touch of silk or the smoothness of a porcelain Sevres cup. But above all, one could see Louis XV dressed in his red velvet and hear his laugh. But then, as is always the case, the memory or the moment dissolved, vanished, evaporated, and I was again alone in the room. It was a perfect memory. One memory I will return to in just a moment. For this room is a biography in architecture and flowers, a life in stone and wood, and a personality in painting and bronze. In an extraordinary way, the Petit Trianon is a portrait of its creator. The artistic elements tell the story of a remarkable life. What is unmistakable is that behind all the carved wood paneling, the plaster cornices, and the paintings, one can see the persona of Louis XV. It is a remarkable abstract portrait. All the elements that create a portrait or a description of an individual, memory, experience, identity, personality, are all incorporated into the Louis XV's Petit Trianon. Yet, these things can be hard to concretely pin down, difficult to capture, and are frequently ineffable. But that is where art and history collide. Art allows us to recreate those emotional and psychological elements to understand them. So how does this perfect building create a portrait of this lonely king? I am going to use one room, the Salon de Compagnie, to tell you the story about the misunderstood and enigmatic Louis XV. A portrait, if you will, because this room, dedicated to flowers, would become his paradise lost. Why Louis XV? Throughout his life, Louis was considered the most beautiful man in his kingdom. He was orphaned at three, and then at five, he became king of France, the most privileged, but also the loneliest position one could experience. Brilliant and sensitive, athletic and energetic, pious and sensual, he loved knowledge, learning, and beauty. Yet he was remarkably shy. That made his job as a public king all the more difficult and problematic. It was something he rebelled against his entire life. Louis was deeply perceptive, but also extremely perspicacious. He was far from perfect, but he oversaw the major changes that occurred in France in the 18th century, for good or ill, depending on your perspective, and in many ways prepared the way for the modern period. Throughout his life, he was surrounded by loss, death, and brutal criticism, and he even survived an assassination attempt. His contradictions make him fascinating and all the more human. The overarching point here is that all these things describing his character and personality resonate within the gardens and the palace of the Petit Trianon, creating the very foundation of his portrait. Designed by the king's favorite architect and confidant, Jacques-Ange Gabriel, the Petit Trianon was begun in 1762 and built with extreme care and without haste. The whole focus of this garden pavilion was to reflect the surrounding environment and to unite comfort and beauty. It was roofed in 1764 and then the decoration of the interiors began. But then tragedy struck. Madame de Pompadour, his valued and beloved companion for 19 years, died. What had started as a collaboration for the two of them became a memory palace that Louis created alone. 
He was involved in every decorative decision and was intimately concerned in the creation of what would become his most precious and private escape, the ultimate self-portrait. Louis was motivated to create a secret and private world, a world where he could be safe in his memories and be himself. In other words, an anti-Versailles. Finally, in 1768, after waiting patiently for six years, Louis was given the keys to the now completed Petit Trianon. Well, almost completed, for some of the principal paintings had yet to be delivered. The building is a basic cube with four different facades, constructed out of golden stone and highlighted with ivory-colored limestone. With the complicated requirements of the site and the absolute necessity to harmonize with the gardens around it, the Petit Trianon was an engineering and artistic tour de force. On the ground floor were all those service rooms designed to make the few servants inconspicuous. It had a grand staircase to the first floor where there was an antechamber, two dining rooms, the Salon de Compagnie, and also Louis' study and library. On the attic level, Louis had his private suite, which is a bit odd for a king, and there were a series of small apartments. Only the select few were invited to the entertainments at Trianon, and only Louis' closest friends were actually asked to spend the night. As any portrait would do, the building came to reflect Louis' character as reflected by his primary interests. From all those parterres producing flowers, fruit, vegetables, and wheat, to the celebrated botanical garden filled with those exotic species from all over the newly discovered world, these different varieties of plants would be integrated in some fashion into the very organization and decorative fabric of the building. But the one room completed from the outset was the Salon de Compagnie. It was a room where interior artifice and exterior naturalness would blend harmoniously with one another. The Salon de Compagnie is a room filled with such wonderment. This room of entertainment and sociability would embody a garden that incorporated the king's interest in science and prosperity, the joys of music, the arts, as well as whisper the themes of abundance love, melancholy, and loss. From the flowers, the cycle of seasons, the themes in the paintings, and the sound of music that has just stopped, all create a room of loss tied to beauty. A perfect abstract representation of Louis' sadness tinged with hope. It was a portrait the retiring and melancholy Louis so poignantly wanted to communicate. Yet, it is all about the flowers, the literal flowers and their mythological creation, because of course, Europeans have had a long tradition of using flowers symbolically and metaphorically. Louis XV's botanist, Duchesne, would record numerous flowers growing in Louis' garden, including the symbolic lily. Remember that Louis had lost his doting parents, his concerned great father, his beloved uncle, and then his devoted tutor, a daughter and a son, his wife, one friend after the other, and then Madame de Pompadour. It was for a man, orphaned as a child, a long and grueling march to the mausoleum. Louis was, yes, the king of flowers and time, but also the king of loss and mourning. Because the room only receives full sun in the afternoon, the quality of the light in the salon is always diffuse and tranquil, never obtrusive or glaring. The quality of light achieved is as if to preserve all those fragile, transient, and beautiful flowers. The room is a literal bouquet that demonstrates Louis' love of flowers and their cultivation, but also their transience and their being memorials of loss and death. These themes are no more powerfully felt than in the paintings over the doors. The subject matter is taken from Ovid's Metamorphosis, and each narrative deals with the transformation of a human into a flower of some type, but transformation at a price, a life. Above the northeast doors are the transformation of Narcissus, an Adonis changed into the anemone by Lepesi. And over the southwest doors are Apollo and Hyacinth, and Clyte transformed into a sunflower by Julin. Each story resonates with the theme of tragic loss, 
And I use as an example the myth of Clytie. Apollo, as is typical of Apollo, was briefly infatuated with Clytie, but soon abandoned her. But Clytie wanted nothing more than to be with Apollo. It is the ultimate story of unrequited love. Because of her obsession, she was mercifully transformed into a sunflower, which turns its head to always look longingly at the sun. Clytie is in a constant state of sadness, as personified by the weeping putti in the foreground, as tears seemingly pool at the base of and drip from the gilded frame. Subtly, Louis's interest in time and in the cycles of life, as well as his interest in death, would be communicated through the themes chosen for the paintings, the subjects in the paneling, and even in the cornice. With its decoration of flowers and of music, the salon is one continual reminder of the passage of time, the guarantee of the seasons, and the resulting abundance from the earth. The room visually communicates that everything has a cycle, that it lives and dies, and then is renewed and lives again. One can almost imagine smelling all those wonderful flowers in Sevres vases or their perfume wafting in when the windows were open. It's no wonder that smell is the most powerful sense to evoke memory. It is possible to feel that bittersweet zephyr of time touch one's cheek. Gabriel, in designing the ornamentation of this room, had his patron's personality well in mind. The decoration became the personification of Louis himself. To name a few, his taste in architecture is found in the purity of line and the classical elements tempered by the Rococo variety of detail. And his dedication to science is illustrated by the telescopes and globes in the paneling. All of these artistic elements would give a melancholic king hope. The Petit Triano is in a way a marker of the passage of time, a seasonal clock. But in this case, it is a clock frozen at a particular moment, a moment when all seems possible and beautiful, frozen in those halcyon moments of spring and summer. The world of the Petit Triano is indeed a world within a world. Even in the depth of winter, with the flurries of snow enveloping the small palace, the interior would always be a garden in full bloom, warm, tranquil, beautiful, and always welcoming. The decoration would cause the viewer, be it king, mistress, courtier, or servant, to anticipate the coming of spring and summer, life, and create a perfect memory. Even after Louis died in 1774, the Petit Trianon would briefly evoke his memory, and one would think of the wistful king who loved beauty, knowledge, exotic plants, and flowers. This architectural portrait of the palace's creator embodies the link between memory and experience, beauty and loss, and how these shape our perception of self and our identity. Now is the moment I return to the memory I began with, sitting alone in and with this room. That memory has now taken on an even more powerful influence on my thinking. As I further develop my idea about architecture as a portrait and as the repository of memory and experience, I suffered the loss of my father. It was yet another tombstone in the graveyard marking the losses I had experienced over the last few years. Two of my dearest friends, my older sister, my remarkable PhD advisor, and then my influential father. It was, and still is, a moment of crisis. But beautifully and poignantly, after my father's death, Louis XV's Salon de Compagnie took on even more significance because the room is all about remembrance and loss. In many ways, the Salon de Compagnie and the Petit Trianon have become part of my portrait. Loss has provided me with more understanding of my work with this solitary and lonely king, who is always trying to fill an emotional void with beauty. It is why his architectural self-portrait is so important. No matter their intended overt use, good portraits are all about emotion, be it memory or loss,
but also assurance and comfort. Through experience and memory, be it historic or personal, we too can create our own paradise lost. Or in Louis XV's case, create within a beautiful room a self-portrait that resonates with the fragrance of memory and the melancholy of flowers. We in the 21st century can learn much from this king and his beautiful room. For what I'm saying is, consider your home or your favorite room a portrait. A portrait that creates and protects memories because architecture, interiors, and works of art all hold the memory of experience, constellation, and feeling. For me, Louis XV's Paradise Lost has become my Paradise Lost. You know, I wish my father could have seen it. Thank you. <laughs>